Hey there, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, we are sitting here at March 15th, 2022, and we are get, getting ready to jump in to week number three in our study in the book of Esther. So as I was getting ready for this, and I was like, well, I need to do a little summary to tell, bring us up to speed because we have some new people in the group. Hello, new people. Glad to have you here. Um, uh, and as I was trying to figure out how to do this, it brought to mind years ago at our, our church, Emmanuel Bible Church, they had an event and it was called Walk Through the Bible. You can look it up online. I'll try to remember to include a link here. So anyways, this event, Walk Through the Bible, was a day-long event in our church. I forget how many total hours it was. So we all met in the sanctuary, the worship center, and they gave a little introduction to everybody, and then they sent all the kids, I'm going to say like 18 and under, to a, a different part of the church, and they went through kind of the same thing that, those, that the adults went through. And what they did was they took the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, and came up with a way to summarize the Old Testament and to teach it to us in a way that we could recite the entire Old Testament history, like the, like the keystone events that happened in the history of the Old Testament. Oh my gosh, it was so much fun. It was amazing. Anyways, I'm trying to do that going through Esther. So <clears throat> this is going to be a, I apologize, excuse me, sort of a rapid fire summary of where we've been so far in the book of Esther. So the beginning of Esther, we have our two main characters, Esther and Mordecai, well, three actually, because King Xerxes. So we have Mordecai and Esther, who are Jews. They are related, um, cousins, aunt, I mean, uncle and niece, it's not really clear. Anyways, Mordecai's adopted Esther, so for all intents and purposes. Um, but they, they are Jewish, but they are living in Persia. And at this point in history, it's about 550-ish BC, Persia is the largest nation in the world. So this king is very powerful. So Mordecai and Esther are Jews living in Persia, but they are undercover Jews. They, they are about three generations removed from the last time that the Israelites were living in their own homeland. So they've been living in exile for about three generations. And so they just kind of had assimilated into the Persian culture. So it is, we have Mordecai and Esther and we have King Xerxes. Xerxes is very powerful. He throws a six month long party, trying to get a bunch of people to come on board with him to run a military campaign. At the end of that six months, he has a huge banquet, food, drink, party galore. At the end of the banquet, of course, everybody's a little bit happy, and he thinks it'd be a great idea if he brings in, tells the servants to go get his wife, who beautiful, Queen Vashti, yeah, bring her in and let her entertain the guests. You know, he's going to show off his beautiful wife, his trophy wife. Well, Vashti was having none of it. She's like, uh -uh. so she blew him off. Well, that made the king mad, and king's people told him, you know, you can't just let her get away with this. Anyways, he boots Vashti out of, the, out of the kingdom. So now he's a king without a queen. So his cronies come up with this great plan to have the bachelorette show. So he invites all the virg virgins from Persia to come to the palace to be, you know, to be submitted for consideration to be queen. So they have this year-long, like, spa treatment that they give these ladies. And they bring them in one by one to the king. Well, the king, Mordecai gets Esther to go along with this, and he sends her off to the palace to participate in this pageant. So when it comes her turn, the king, you know, has her come to him. I won't go into the gory details, but he picks her, to make a long story short, and he makes her the queen. So now we have Esther as a queen. She's living in the palace with the king of Persia. Mordecai is still in the employ of the palace. He is outside the palace gates. So um, Mordecai hears of this assassination plot from two of the king's inner circle dudes. And when he finds out about this, he tells Esther, you need to tell the king these two guys are going to kill him. So Esther goes to the king, tells him that one of his servants, his servant by the name of Mordecai, has uncovered this plot. And the king is eternally grateful. He has the two guys killed and he elevates Mordecai by putting his name in a book. Yeah, that's what Mordecai got for his bravery. But it was kind of kind of a big deal. He actually wrote Mordecai's name in the king's official record, stating on, on this day and time, 
my subject Mordecai uh, saved my life. So he saves his life and then life goes on. Well, the king becomes very paranoid at this point. Um, he's thinking, I'm not safe. My inner circle isn't who they pretend to be. So rather than take a risk, he decides to bring an outsider in to run the, to run the daily operations of his internal crew. Well, the person he brings in is a mortal enemy of the Jewish nation, a dude by the name of Haman. So now Haman is running things, and Haman is very pompous, and he hates the Jews. But he just, he's going around the kingdom making everybody bow down to him. Well, at some point in this transition, Haman grows a spine and decides he's going, now he's going to own up to his Jewish heritage. And when Haman comes out and all these people are bowing down before him, Mordecai refuses. Hmm. Haman doesn't like that. So Haman devises this plot that he goes to the king and tells the king that there's this group of people in his kingdom that are have sort of grown up among the kingdom and uh, they don't follow the king's rules and they don't worship the king's gods. And so Haman convinces the king that all of this, all these people should be killed. He gets them to write it down, seals it with his ring, makes it official, writes it out in every language, blah, blah, blah. Mordecai gets wind of this. He knows now that the Jews are about to be annihilated, mass genocide of his entire nation. So he just loses it. Sackcloth and ashes, he goes to the temple, I mean the, the palace gate, and he is wailing and mourning and petitioning on behalf of his people. Well, Esther sees that, hears about it, and she is embarrassed, and she is terrified. Now, she is still a closet Jew. She's not let people know that she's Jewish. Mordecai has come out as a Jew. When she sees or hears that Mordecai is acting like this, she sends people out and gets, you know, here, Mordecai, get dressed, you know, quiet down, what are you doing? And Mordecai then, through her servant, tells her what's going on, gives her actually a copy of the edict. So now Esther knows that the king is preparing to kill her people. And Mordecai tells her, you've got to do something about this. And Esther's like, if I go to the king, I haven't been with him for a month. If I go in now, he'll kill me. The only way I have a chance is if I, if I approach him and he reaches out his golden scepter to me, that means that I'm allowed in. If I approach him and he's not feeling a love, he's going to have me killed. So this is a life or death deal for her. So she tells Mordecai to have all of the Jews pray and fast for three days and that she would do the same. So that brings us up to speed. That is a uh, seven-minute summary of the first four chapters of Esther. So we pick up our story now in chapter five. So here we are in chapter five of Esther. So now it came about that Esther gets all dressed up. Now she's, she's, she's had this three days of fasting and prayer and the Jews have fasted and prayed for three days. So now this is her big, this is her big moment. This is her stepping out in faith. She's taking her life in her hands. She puts on her royal robes and she approaches the king's palace in front of the king's rooms. And the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room opposite the entrance to the palace. Now, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the courtyard, moment of truth, she obtained favor in his sight. And the king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the top of the scepter. Whew. So she got, she got past that. <clears throat> and the king says, What's what's troubling you, Queen Esther? What's what your what's your request? What can I do for you? And so Esther says, "Well, if it pleases the king, may the king have Haman, evil Haman, come to a banquet that I will prepare for you." So now she's throwing a dinner party for just the three of them: the king, Haman, who's about to kill her people, and Esther. So the king says, "Okay." He tells the servants, "Go and get Haman and bring him quickly so that we can have this banquet that Esther wants." So the king and Haman, I'm, I'm down to verse six, uh, five now. The king and Haman came to the banquet which Esther had prepared and they drank their wine at the banquet. And the king said to Esther, what is your request? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your wish? Up to half the kingdom and it shall be done. So Esther replied, this is so clever. Esther replied, my request and my wish is if I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my request and do what I wish, may the king and Haman come to the banquet 
which I will prepare for them tomorrow, and I will do as the king says. So she's roped Haman in. Now Haman's feeling pretty special. He's having dinner with the king and Esther, just the three. And Esther says, okay, let's do this again tomorrow. Let's have Haman come back for yet another banquet. So now Haman goes strutting out the palace, full of himself, quite pleased. Haman went out on that day, joyful and pleased of heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's gate, and that Mordecai did not stand or tremble at him, Haman was filled with anger against Mordecai. Haman controlled himself, however, and he went to his house. But he sent for his friends and his wife. So then Haman told all these people of the glory of his riches and his many sons and every occasion upon which the king had honored him and how he had promoted him above everyone else. Then Haman also said, even Esther the queen, let no one except me come with the king to the banquet which she prepared. And tomorrow also I am invited by her with the king. Yet all of this does not satisfy me every time I see that Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. So then his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said, here's what you do. Have a wooden gallows, 50 cubits high made in the morning, ask the king to have Mordecai hanged on it, and then go joyfully with the king to the banquet. Done deal. And the advice pleased him. So he had the wooden gallows made. Now there must have been some really great craftsmen because they did it really fast. So Haman is feeling fine. He thinks he is the cat's meow. He's the number two guy in all of Persia. And now, not only has the king elevated him to this position, but now it looks like the queen also thinks he's mighty fine. That he's just such an honorable person, and now he gets to have dinner with the two of them two nights in a row. He is so full of himself, so prideful. Hmm. <coughs> <coughs> What's that phrase? Pride comes before the fall, right? <coughs> Excuse me. Now we're to chapter six. So this is the night before banquet number two. Haman's plot is to start the next day by having Mordecai hung. Okay? So this is the night before. So during that night, the king could not sleep. Gee, I wonder why. So he gave an order <coughs> to bring the Book of Records, the Chronicles. <coughs> and they were, <coughs> they were read before the king. <coughs> he must have really had insomnia. And it was found written that Mordecai had reported about these two guys, whose names I can't pronounce, two, two of the king's eunuchs who were doorkeepers, that they had sought to attack the king. Then the king said, what honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for doing this? And the king's servants who attended to him said, nothing has been done for him. So the king's servants, I'm sorry, nothing has been done for him. So the king said, who's in the courtyard? So this is Haman coming to the king, wanting to have Mordecai killed. Who's in the courtyard? Now Haman had just entered the outer courtyard, the king's palace, in order to speak to the king about hanging Mordecai on the wooden gallows which we had prepared. So the king's servant said to him, behold, Haman is standing in the courtyard. And the king said, have him come in. <laughs> This just cracks me up every time. I mean, I love I love reading the Bible because every time I read it, I learn something new and I see kind of a different a different angle, a different twist. It's just it's so rich. Have him come in. Haman then came in, and the king said to him, "What is to be done for the man that the king desires to honor?" And Haman said to himself, hmm, "Who 
would the king desire to honor more than me? Therefore Haman said to the king, For the man whom the king desires to honor, have them bring a royal robe which the king has worn, and the horse on which the king has ridden, and on whose head a royal turban has been placed. Then order them to hand the robe and the horse over to one of the king's noble officials, and have them dress, have them dress the man whom the king desires to honor, and lead him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, so it shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. Isn't that rich? So here's Haman thinking that he's, you know, okay, what do I want to have done? You know, there's that will do unto others, but <laughs> it doesn't quite turn out the way that he hoped. So Haman says, you know, this is what I would do for the one you want to honor, thinking that it's him. <laughs> then the king said to Haman, quickly take the robe and the horse, just as you have said, and do so for Mordecai the Jew, who is sitting at the king's gate. Do not fail to do any of the things that you have said. So Haman took the robe and the horse, <laughs> and he dressed Mordecai <laughs> and led him on horseback through the city square and proclaimed before him, so it shall be done for the man whom the king desires to honor. Oh my word. Can you imagine? So talk about the pride coming, pride cometh before the fall. I, I, oh my goodness. I, I just, I love, I love this story. I was like, anyways, <laughs> it just cracks me up. It, it's like Hollywood could not write something like this. And this is history. This is like really what happened. It's, it's just perfect. So now, going back over what happened. So we've covered what's happened to this point. And when I was looking at Esther, she took a leap of faith at the beginning of this uh, section that we're talking about. She took a leap of faith and it paid off, right? So she actually did really take her life in her hands by approaching the king because the law of the land said, you approach and the king doesn't want you, you're dead. She took that risk, but she didn't do it until after much prayer and fasting. So what does that teach us about how we should approach significant decisions in our life? Should we, let's see, go and ask our best friend, what should, what should we do? Should we, I'm not saying it's not, a, it's, it's not okay to, to ask trusted friends for advice. But what we learn from this story, what the appropriate and the, the advisable thing to do is to take it to God, take it to the Lord. This week, I, well, this weekend rather, I had some very challenging circumstances in my life with one of my, um, I'll call him a coworker. And it has been very difficult for me. I have been accused of things that I didn't do. I have been judged very unfairly, and it doesn't, not, nothing that was said against me made any sense to me. And it was just a constant barrage of messages for a couple of days. And I kept looking at this, and it's totally out of character for this person, this person who's laying these allegations against me. Now, it's just between this person and myself. As far as I know, I don't know that they're saying it to anybody else, but I felt very unfairly treated and it hurt my feelings. And I was mad because I was being accused of doing things that I hadn't done. Well, not, not of doing things I hadn't done. I was being accused of evil intent for what I had done. There's nothing wrong with what I did, but this person assumed that I was, had some sort of nefarious intent and bad motives behind what I did when that wasn't the case at all. But it was, it's very out of character for this person. So I, I mean, my, my initial, you know, when we get, when we get wronged, like, um, well, what was being 
about to be precipitated upon the Jews. They were about to be wronged severely. I mean, genocide's pretty, pretty harsh. So we, we want to defend ourselves, don't we? We want to go, um, I don't know, we want to fight back. That's my tendency anyways. I, I, want to, I want to justify myself. I want to, I want to go back to the person and say, you're being, you're being totally unfair. Now, this is all written correspondence. So there was none of this that was face-to-face, -face, even, you know, Zoom to Zoom. It was all written. And sometimes that's good. In this case, it was probably good because I had the opportunity to read it, put it down, not react, think about it, pray about it, sleep on it, to try to decide, well, what am I going to do? Do I report this behavior because it's wildly inappropriate or, or what? Because I knew I, was, I wasn't doing what I was being accused of doing or for the reasons I've been accused of doing it. So anyways, I was just, I was beside myself, honestly. And then our internet went down. We had, we, we went to bed Friday night, woke up Saturday and we had no internet. That's kind of a big deal in our house. For one thing, it's a health and safety issue for my husband. So Mel has a, you know, one of those life alert things that relies upon our internet telephone in order for him to get help if something were to happen and I couldn't hear him or, you know, I had gone out to get the mail. So anyways, so it's a safety issue, aside from the fact that it's a huge inconvenience when I run an internet business, you know, that I require being online most of the time. So that was happening and all this was happening with this person. And I just was beside myself. And every time I felt like, oh, I need, I'm going to talk to this person and ask them what they think. I'm going to talk to that person, ask them what they think. Thankfully, thank you, Lord, I stopped. I don't do this all the time. Sometimes I just go and say what I'm going to say and do what I'm going to do, and then I regret it later. But in this instance, I stopped. You know, this person kept sending me message after message after message, just raking me over the coals in texts. And I said, I didn't do that. And I just replied as succinctly and as calmly as I could until it finally died down. Now, I still haven't come to a resolution with this person, but I came to a point of peace in myself because I went, I took it to the Lord. I, I didn't fast. I, I, I don't think I've ever fasted for more than about 24 hours. So I guess I need to work on that. But I did pray a lot, a lot. And I asked God, what should I do? You know, how do I handle this? Just like Esther was asking me, how do I, how do I deal with this situation? And I venture to guess that probably all of us have that in our lives, where we have decisions, we have situations that seem very unfair. Maybe somebody has done something to you that just seems really unfair. And maybe it is really unfair. I mean, this was really un unfair to, to, to the Jewish people and to Mordecai. But if we take it to God, you know, the, the, the Bible tells us that he is our avenger, that we are to release it to him and let him deal with it. And that is really not easy to do. So, I don't know if you know who Max Lucado is. You probably do. He's a pastor and a writer. You'll hear him on the radio a lot. Um, he loves alliteration, and I love the way he phrases some things. And when he was sort of giving a summary of this part of the story, he summarized Esther's whole journey through this. She went from conformity, so living like a Persian and completely denouncing her Jewish heritage, to courage, going before the king when she risked everything. So she went from conformity to courage. She went from fear to faith. They're pretty diametrically opposed to one another, aren't they? She went from fear to faith. And then thirdly, she went from reliance on self to reliance on God. Now, there's probably been times in all of our lives when we've been faced with those decisions. Am I going to conform 
go along with the flow, go along with the crowd, or am I going to have courage and stand up for what's right? Am I going to be fearful of what's going to happen, or am I going to have faith that God's got it and under control and that he'll take care of me? And then am I going to rely on myself, or am I going to rely on God? Now, I don't know about you, but I do know about me. And the first two aren't terribly challenging for me most of the time. I've been through enough situations in my life where God has proved himself to me to be so faithful and so loving, even when I didn't deserve it, that the faith over fear, I'll usually choose faith over fear almost every time. Courage over conformity. I've never been much of one for going along with the crowd anyway, so that's not as hard for me. But oh boy, the self-reliance versus relying on God. That one, that one I struggle with. I am fiercely independent, ask anyone who knows me. And so a lot of times I, I just, I want to take things into my own hands and I want to do it myself. I want to fix it. I want to address the problem. I want to address the issue and I want to get it nailed down and move on. And like the case was this weekend with this person, it became very clear to me after a lot of prayer that that was really not my place. I suspect that the person on the other side of this equation is going through something. There's, there, there's some other issue. You know, they say hurt people hurt people. I'm guessing that there's something going on in this person's life that caused them to change their stripes in such a dramatic way in these interactions, because that is not, that does, it just doesn't jive with anything else that I have seen from this person in any other environment, whether it be through small group coaching calls or large environment um, help tech sessions. It's just not who this person seems to be. But this weekend, it was just, it really threw me for a loop. So I, I'm having to continue to work on that relying on God thing because I really want to, I'm a fixer. I want to fix things. So can you think of a time in your own life when maybe you've been faced with that choice of conformity or courage, fear or faith, reliance on self or reliance on God? What did you do? Maybe you're in that situation now. What are you going to do? I encourage you to choose the option of faith and courage and relying on God. You know, looking through this whole story, the verses of Romans 8.28 come to mind. Of, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. We talk about purpose a lot in this group. We talk about being called for purpose and being here for a reason, for a season, for a reason. And it's true. But when we're in the middle of hard things, it's hard to see that. It's really hard. There's another passage in scripture. Let me see if I wrote it down. There it is. So talking about, you know, giving it to God and letting him take care of it. The verses in Romans 12, 1 through 2 came to mind. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So we are to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Chuck, I'm pretty sure it was Chuck Swindoll, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, that said, the problem with a living sacrifice is it keeps wanting to crawl off the altar. Yeah, sad but true. So for me, again, I'm just talking about me here. You're in charge of your own, how you deal with, with uh, the truths that the Bible brings to our minds and to, our, to the forefront of our minds as we, as we search it for his truth. I need to do that every day, pretty much. I need to make a conscious effort. And it's gotten a little easier. It's, what, Tuesday? Is it Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. And this has been going on since with this person since Friday, Saturday. 
it's getting a little bit easier and I am going to have to schedule a time to sort of have a one on one conversation. But I need to make sure that my that my heart's in the right place before I do that, because I'm afraid that if I am not, well, I know if I'm not prepared, I'm going to say say things that I will wish that I hadn't. And I won't be operating in surrender to the spirit. So I need to make sure that I'm there. So if you would, I would ask you to pray for me in that regard as I'm preparing to deal with this person. And if you guys have situations in your life um, that you'd like for us to pray about, if it's something you feel comfortable sharing with the group, we have that little prayer tab inside the group. Feel free to post a prayer request there. Or if, if it's something more personal and you just want to share it with one other person, I volunteer to be that person for you. There's other people in the group that you may um, you may have connected with. You may resonate with something that they said or the way that they said it, and you you feel a connection with another person in my group. I hope that's true. But I hope that you will feel comfortable to bring your petitions to another believer um, so we can pray with you and for you in that regard. But I do ask, if you would, to please pray for me as I prepare to deal with this situation in my own life. Oh, boy, we're out of time. It's 8 o'clock already. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't know if anybody... I don't even know if anybody was on live. Yes, there were a few here. Mel's here this week. Mary, thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, Mary, for, for agreeing to pray with me for this. It's I need to talk to you again, too. We need to catch up. I meant to do that this weekend, but then when the internet went out, it, it just didn't happen. So we, we will get back on the phone this week sometime, hopefully. But I'm just going to close with a quick prayer, if I may. Father God, thank you for the way that you work in mysterious ways. Um, not just in the Old Testament, not just in the stories that we read, but in our own lives as well, that there are circumstances and there are threads that are pulled through the tapestry of our lives that sometimes we don't see the beauty of the image that you're weaving. We just see the mess that's on the underside of the tapestry. And the Lord, please help us with our faith that we would choose rather than to be, well, people like me, the independent creatures, to be self-reliant, help us to learn to surrender, um, to present ourselves as a living sacrifice and let you take control, let you take the wheel. Thank you for loving us even when we are unlovely. And I just ask that you would be with each and every person that's on this call tonight or watching this on the replay, that you would minister to their hearts and their minds through your word and that you would go with us now as we go our separate ways. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Thank you for giving us your word that we can read freely anytime we want and that you have given us your word to teach us and instruct us to live the lives that you've created us to live. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope you all have a great rest of your week and I look forward to doing this again next week. Take care, y'all.